a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. 1974 Super Outbreak The 1974 Super Outbreak was the second largest tornado outbreak on record for a single 24-hour period, just behind the 2011 Super Outbreak. It was also the most violent tornado outbreak ever recorded, with 30 F4 slash F5 tornadoes confirmed. From April 3 to April 4, 1974, there were 148 tornadoes confirmed in 13 U.S. states and the Canadian province of Ontario. In the United States, tornadoes struck Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, and New York. The entire outbreak caused more than $600 million in damage in the United States alone, and extensively damaged approximately 900 mi2 along a total combined path length of 2,600 miles at one point. As many as 15 separate tornadoes were ongoing at the same time. The 1974 super outbreak remains one of the most outstanding severe convective weather episodes of record in the continental United States. The outbreak far surpassed previous and succeeding events in terms of severity, longevity, extent, and death toll with the notable exception of the 2011 super outbreak, which lasted from April 25 to 28 and killed a total of 324 people. Meteorological Synopsis A powerful springtime low-pressure system developed across the North American interior plains on April 1, while moving into the Mississippi and Ohio Valley areas. A surge of very moist air intensified the storm further while there were sharp temperature contrasts between both sides of the system. Officials at NOAA and in the National Weather Service forecast offices were expecting a severe weather outbreak on April 3, but not to the extent that ultimately occurred. Several F2 and F3 tornadoes had struck portions of the Ohio Valley and the South in a separate Earlier outbreak on April 1 and 2, which included three killer tornadoes in Kentucky, Alabama, and Tennessee. The town of Campbellsburg, northeast of Louisville, was hard hit in this earlier outbreak, with a large portion of the town destroyed by an F3. Between the two outbreaks, an additional tornado was reported in Indiana in the early morning hours of April 3, several hours before the official start of the outbreak, on Wednesday. April 3, severe weather watches already were issued from the morning from south of the Great Lakes. While in portions of the upper Midwest, snow was reported, with heavy rain falling across central Michigan and much of Ontario. By 12 at con April 3, a large-scale trough extended over most of the contiguous United States, with several modest short waves rotating around the broad base of the trough. The mid-latitude low-pressure center over Kansas continued to deepen to 980 MB, and wind speeds at the 850 MB level increased to 50 knots over portions of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Due to significant moisture advection, destabilization rapidly proceeded apace. The warm front near the Gulf Coast dissipated, and then redeveloped northward over the Ohio River Valley. Consequently, Cape levels in the region rose to 1000 J slash kg. However, a warm temperature plume in the elevated mixed layer kept thunderstorms from initiating at the surface. Meanwhile, a large mesoscale convective system that had developed overnight in Arkansas continued to strengthen due to strong environmental lapse rates. Later in the day, strong daytime heating caused instability to further rise. By 18 at Cape values in excess of 2,500 J slash kg were present over the lower Ohio and the Mississippi Valley. As wind speeds in the troposphere increased, large-scale lifting overspread the warm sector. At the same time, the forward-propagating MCs spread into the Tennessee and Ohio valleys, where it evolved into the first of three main convection bands that produced tornadoes. This first convective band moved rapidly northeast, at times reaching speeds of about 60 knots. However, thunderstorm activity, for the moment, remained mostly elevated in nature. By 1630 UTK, the large MCs began to splinter into two sections. The southern part slowed, lagging into southeast Tennessee, while the northern part accelerated, reaching Pennsylvania by 1930 UTK. The split was related to several factors, 
including a band of subsidence over eastern Kentucky and western West Virginia, local downslope winds over the Appalachians, and an inversion over the same area. These factors allowed the northern part of the MCs to accelerate due to efficient ducting, while the southern part slowed as the boundary layer warmed and moistened. Numerous surface-based supercells began to develop in the southern area, beginning with one that produced an F3 tornado at about 1,630 Utk near Cleveland, Tennessee. Meanwhile, a new band of scattered thunderstorms developed at 1,500 Utk over eastern Arkansas and Missouri. Over the next four hours, this band became the focus for several intense supercells, starting in eastern Illinois and southern Indiana. In the wake of the MCs, backing low-level winds, rapid diurnal destabilization, and perhaps cool, mid-level advection had occurred over the warm sector, weakening the convective inhibition layer, and favorable wind profiles bolstered helicity to over 230 square meters slash s squared, a combination of factors conducive to tornado genesis. Consequently, the storms increased in intensity and coverage as they moved into Illinois, Indiana, and northern Kentucky, producing several tornadoes, including the first F5 tornado of the day, at 1920 Utk, near DePau, Indiana. Several of the storms to form between 1920 and 2020 Utk became significant, long-lived supercells, producing many strong or violent tornadoes, including three F5s at DePau. Xenia, Ohio, and Brandenburg, Kentucky. These storms formed the second of three convective bands to generate tornadoes. While violent tornado activity increased over the warm sector, a third band of convection developed at about 60 Nuck and extended from near St. Louis into west central Illinois, based upon real time satellite imagery and model data. Differential positive articity advection coincided with the left exit region of an upper-level jet streak that reached wind speeds of up to 130 knots, thereby enhancing thunderstorm growth. Storms grew rapidly in height and extent, producing baseball-sized hail by 1720 Utkin, Illinois and, shortly thereafter, in St. Louis, Missouri, which reported a very severe thunderstorm early in the afternoon that, while not producing a tornado, was the costliest storm to hit the city up to that time. By 1950 Utk, supercells producing F3 tornadoes hit the Decatur and normal areas in Illinois. As thunderstorms moved into the warmer, moister air mass over eastern Illinois and Indiana, they produced longer-lived tornadoes, one of which began near Otterbein, and ended near Angola in Indiana, a distance of 109 miles meanwhile. By Ooak the southern half of the first convective band became indistinguishable from new convection that had formed farther south over Alabama and Tennessee in connection with convective band 2. In this area, increasing west-southwesterly wind shear at all levels of the troposphere, juxtaposed over near-parallel outflow boundaries, allowed successive supercells, all producing strong, long-track tornadoes, to develop unconstrained by their outflow in a broad region, from South Tennessee into eastern Mississippi. These storms, forming after 23 Yutk, produced some of the most powerful tornadoes of the outbreak, including two F5s near Tanner and an extremely potent F5 that devastated Gwyn in Alabama. Michigan was not hit as hard as neighboring states, or Windsor, with only one deadly tornado that hit near Coldwater and Hillsdale, killing people in mobile homes. However, thunderstorm downpours caused flash floods, and north of the warm front in the Upper Peninsula, heavy snowfall was reported. Activity in the south moved towards the Appalachians during the overnight hours and produced the final tornadoes across the southeast during the morning of April 4. A series of studies by Dr. Tetsuya T. Fujita in 1974-75, which were later cited in a 2004 survey by Risk Management Solutions, found that three-quarters of all tornadoes in the 1974 super outbreak were produced by 30 families of tornadoes, multiple tornadoes spawned in succession by a single thunderstorm cell. The majority of these were long-lived and long-tracked individual supercells. Events and Aftermath Never before had so many violent tornadoes been observed in a single tornado outbreak. There were seven F5 tornadoes and 23 F4 tornadoes. The outbreak began in Morris, Illinois, at around 1 p.m. on April 3. 
As the storm system moved east, where daytime heating had made the air more unstable, the tornadoes grew more intense. A tornado that struck near Monticello, Indiana was an F4, and had a path length of 121 miles, the longest path length of any tornado for this outbreak. Nineteen people were killed in this tornado. The first F5 tornado of the day struck the city of Xenia, Ohio, at 4.40 p.m. EDT. It killed 34, injured 1,150, completely destroyed about one-fourth of the city and caused serious damage in another fourth of the city. Seven F5s were observed, one each in Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky, three in Alabama and the final one which crossed through parts of Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. Thirty-one were killed in Brandenburg, Kentucky, and twenty-eight died in Gwynn, Alabama. One tornado also occurred in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, killing nine and injuring thirty others there, all of them at the former Windsor Curling Club. During the peak of the outbreak, a staggering 16 tornadoes were on the ground simultaneously. At one point forecasters in Indiana, frustrated, because they could not keep up, with all of the simultaneous tornado activity, put the entire state of Indiana under a blanket tornado warning. This was the first, and only time in U.S. history that an entire state was under a tornado warning. There were 18 hours of continuous tornado activity. The outbreak finally ended in Caldwell County, North Carolina, at about 7 a.m. on April 4. A total of 319 were killed in 148 tornadoes. From April 3 through April 4 and 5, 484 were injured. The 1974 super outbreak occurred at the end of a very strong, nearly record-setting La Nina event. The 1973-74 La Nina was just as strong as the 1998-99 La Nina. Despite the apparent connection between La Nina and two of the largest tornado outbreaks in U.S. history, no definitive linkage exists between La Nina and this outbreak or tornado activity in general. Some tornado myths were soundly debunked by tornado activity during the outbreak. Xenia, Ohio the tornado that struck the city of Xenia, Ohio stands as the deadliest individual tornado of the 1974 super outbreak, killing 32 people and destroying a significant portion of the town. The tornado formed near Bellbrook, Ohio, southwest of Xenia, at about 4.30 p.m. EDT. It began as a moderate-sized tornado, then intensified while moving northeast at about 50 miles per hour. The tornado exhibited a multiple vortex structure and became very large as it approached town. Gil Whitney, the weather specialist for FIO TV and Dayton, alerted viewers in Montgomery and Greene counties about the possible tornado, broadcasting the radar image of the supercell with a pronounced hook echo on the rear flank of the storm several minutes before it actually struck. The storm was visible on radar, because of raindrops wrapping around the circulation. The massive tornado slammed into the western part of Xenia, completely flattening the Windsor Park and Arrowhead subdivisions at F5 intensity, and sweeping away entire rows of brick homes, with little debris left behind in some areas. Extensive windrowing of debris occurred in nearby fields. When the storm reached central Xenia, at 4.40 p.m., apartment buildings, homes, businesses, churches, and schools including Xenia High School were destroyed. Students in the school, practicing for a play, took cover in the main hallway seconds before the tornado dropped a school bus onto the stage where they had been practicing, and extensively damaged the school building. Several railroad cars were lifted and blown over as the tornado passed over a moving Penn Central freight train in the center of town. It toppled headstones in Cherry Grove Cemetery, then moved through the length of the downtown business district, passing west of the courthouse. Numerous businesses in downtown Xenia were heavily damaged or destroyed, and several people were killed at the A&W root beer stand as the building was flattened. Past downtown, the tornado continued into the Pinecrest Garden District, which was extensively affected. The Xenia tornado was recorded on film by one resident, and its sound was recorded on tape by a Mr. Brook shoulder from inside an apartment complex. Before the tornado hit the building, the resident left the tape recorder on, and it was found after the storm. At the same time a few blocks away, 16-year-old Xenia resident Bruce Boyd captured 3 minutes and 21 seconds of footage with a Super 8 
8mm movie camera, a pre-1973 model without sound recording capability. The footage was later paired with the nearby tape recording. Boyd's film shows multiple vortices within the larger circulation as the storm swept through Xenia. Upon exiting Xenia, the tornado passed through Wilberforce, heavily damaging several campus and residential buildings of Wilberforce University. Central State University also sustained considerable damage, and a water tower there was toppled. Afterwards, the tornado weakened before dissipating in Clark County near South Vienna, traveling a little over 30 miles. Its maximum width was a half mile in Xenia. The same parent storm later spawned a weaker tornado northeast of Columbus in Franklin County. 32 people lost their lives in the Twister, and about 1,150 were injured in Xenia. In addition to the direct fatalities, two Ohio Air National Guardsmen deployed for disaster assistance were killed on April 17, when a fire swept through their temporary barracks in a furniture store. The memorial in downtown Xenia lists 34 deaths. In honor of the two Guardsmen, about 1,400 buildings were heavily damaged or destroyed. Damage was estimated at 100 million US dollars. There was no early warning from NOAA Weather Wire Service about this storm. President Richard Nixon made an unannounced visit to Xenia a few days later. It would be the first city affected by the 1974 super outbreak that he would visit. Upon inspecting the damage, he said, As I look back over the disasters, I saw the earthquake in Anchorage in 1964. I saw the hurricanes, Hurricane Camille in 1969 down in Mississippi, and I saw Hurricane Agnes in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. And it is hard to tell the difference among them all, but I would say in terms of destruction, just total devastation, this is the worst I have seen. President Nixon immediately declared Xenia a disaster area. Although the Federal Disaster Relief Act was already introduced in 1973, it still had not passed Congress. The 1974 super outbreak disaster was a catalyst for accelerated passage of the act through Congress in 1974. According to Nixon, it took several months for the city to recover from the tornado, with the help of the Red Cross and the Ohio National Guard assisting the recovery efforts. Most of the town was quickly rebuilt afterward. In recognition of their coverage of the tornado under difficult circumstances, the staff of the Xenia Daily Gazette won the Pulitzer Prize for spot news reporting in 1975. The Xenia tornado was one of two rated F5 that affected Ohio during the outbreak. The other striking the Cincinnati area. Xenia was later struck by two other tornadoes, both a smaller one in April 1989 and a larger one in September 2000 which was an F4 twister that killed one and injured about 100 in an area parallel to and just north of the 1974 path. Before the 1974 storm, the city had no tornado sirens. After the F5 tornado hit on April 3, 1974, 10 sirens were installed across the area. Dr. Ted Fujito and a team of colleagues undertook a 10-month study of the 1974 super outbreak. Along with discovering much about tornadoes which was not known before, such as the downburst and the microburst, and assessing damage to surrounding structures, the Xenia tornado was determined to be the worst of the 148 storms. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries Would you like to know more?